Good morning and a big welcome to this City Talk webinar. This is the second in a series of three events featuring results from our Nord Green project on smart planning for green and healthy Nordic cities. A big thank you to all of you who are joining us for this second event. My name is Annika Östman and I'm head of communications at Nordregio. I'll be moderating today's session together with my colleague Lisa Rohr. The title of today's webinar is how to use and connect green space and health indicators in city planning. Over the next hour, we'll hear presentations from our partners and we'll have a panel discussion. And of course, we'd love to hear from you. So please use the chat function to add your comments and any questions you may have. We'll also be sharing the presentations and the video recording with you after the event. So now let me hand over to Lisa, who will say a little bit more about Nordgreen, and then we'll present our speakers. Great. Thanks, Annika. Uh, as Annika said, my name is Lisa Rohr. I'm a junior research fellow here at Nordregio, and I work with the Nordgreen project funded by Nordforsk. And Nordgreen develops solutions for well-designed, high-quality green space that promotes equity, health, and well-being. We use an innovative research approach that examines the health green space nexus, with assistance from epidemiological research, environmental psychology, co-creation, and governance. And to do this, we have a consortium with the participation of four research institutions in six Nordic cities. And today we have here with us our partners from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences, and Tabi Municipality. And they will share with us their experiences and discuss the use and applicability of objective and perceived green space and health indicators for planning purposes. Our first speaker today is Tove Jägerhök. Tove is a senior landscape architect and project manager at Teabi Municipality. She has worked as a project manager for the municipality's new green plan and has been involved in the development of the municipality's comprehensive plan. She's also works, she also works with different projects regarding development of public space. <clears throat> Over to you, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. Hang on, Dove, we're going to introduce the rest of our speakers. Oh, sorry. No, <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, so after Tuve, we will hear from Ger Omut. Ger is a professor in epidemiology at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, and he works with projects focused on environmental factors such as air pollution, noise, and drinking water, in addition to green space and different health outcomes such as mental health and well-being, heart disease, and hip fractures. And finally, we'll hear from Emma Nordbo and Helena Nord. Emma Nordbo holds a PhD in public health science and is associate professor at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Her research focuses on examining how factors of the built and social environment, that includes green urban space, influences health, well being, and active living in different groups of the population. And then we'll hear from Helena, who is a landscape architect and senior lecturer at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences and a professor also at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Helena's research focuses on use and experiences of various urban green spaces. So after all those introductions, now it's your turn to let me hand over to you who will start off the presentations. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you can see, um, my background shows part of the Tabby municipality, and uh, it's uh, very green. <clears throat> and I will talk a little bit about uh, our planning in Tabby for green space and health. Uh, next, please. Uh, first, some uh, Quick facts and figures. Uh, Tabby is situated uh, 15 kilometers north of Stockholm and uh, it's uh, 71 square kilometers, including surface and seawater areas. And uh, there are uh, about 75,000 inhabitants and it's part of an expanding urban area. And the municipality is also part of a high quality regional green infrastructure that includes high quality woods, agricultural landscapes, rivers, lakes, and seawater bays. 
And residents of Tabby have a high level of education and are relatively well off compared to the Swedish average. Next, please. Uh, and some things about the urban development in Tabby. And Tabby has a long history of rural settlements, uh, but urban urbanization started late and most of the municipalities housing development has taken place after the 1950s, even though uh, first permanent settlements appeared during the Bronze Age. And access to recreational green infrastructure has been an important planning goal for most of the municipalities housing development from Garden City via holiday homes to modernist residential complexes and neighborhood planning. Uh, the location in a conurbation entails a lot of transport infrastructure and transport infrastructure can create barriers in terms of inhabitants accessibility to green space. And transport infrastructure can also create noise pollution that affects the restorative qualities of public space. Next please. So planning for green space and health in Tabby is uh, governed by the comprehensive plan, by its uh, goals. And uh, the comprehensive plan sets five, five sustainability goals for the municipality connecting to UN's Global Agenda 2030 and the national environmental objectives. And these goals are attractive and safe, accessible and connected, biodiverse and healthy, innovative and business friendly and robust and climate smart. So we work with those in the planning process in different ways. Next, please. The green plan guides planning for healthy access to green space by guiding the work of the city planning office towards meeting the comprehensive plans goals for preserving and developing green in infrastructure in Tabby and facilitating assessments regarding natural and cultural values, landscape and visual impact, environmental and climate aspects, and fulfillment of legal requirements. And uh, by contributing to efficient use of ecosystem services in TABI through increased knowledge and system understanding for managers, planners, and policymakers. The Green Plan also serves as a guidance in comprehensive planning master plans, operational planning, management planning, and all projects that concern green infrastructure in TABI. Next, please. So um, we work uh, with indicators for green space in the green plan, but we don't have health indicators. And uh, we have uh, in planning offices difficulties in assessing the relevance of accessible health data and projects like Nord Green can help us understand how this can be done in efficient and relevant ways. Um, green space indicators are used in the green plan to measure size of and distance to green space, to avoid sources of error concerning accessibility to green space. As I said before, we have a lot of barriers. The green plan uses pedestrian network data to calculate distance to green space and locate areas of deficiency. The analysis does not include all kinds of green space. So we had this quality analysis where areas with limited recreational value have been excluded from the analysis. For example, very small green areas and green areas disturbed by, by heavy traffic. And uh, this example shows areas of deficiency of overall access to green space defined in the green plan. Next, please. So, we believe that recreational green space in Tabby should be of high quality and offer opportunities for physical activity, restoration, social interaction, and intellectual stimulation. And the green plan aims to evaluate access to different green space qualities and offer guidelines for access and define areas of deficiency. And this example shows areas with access to restorative and quiet qualities defined in the green plan. Next, please. We also analyze uh, access to Tabby's green trails network. And 
most of the areas of deficiency have access to trails in neighboring municipalities. And parkways and green streets and sidewalks are an important complement, but have not been included in this analysis. But we use a lot, um, we use them a lot to, to evaluate um, inhabitants' access to parks in other ways. Next, please. We also use uh, indicators for biodiversity connected to standardized natural value inventories. And to address the, ch the challenge of climate change, the Green Plan offers indicators and guidelines for tree canopy cover. And additional green space quality indicators for parks and natural areas are used in different management plans that we use to take care of our green infrastructure. Next. So that was all. And uh, I would like to thank you all for listening and hand over to Geir to continue the presentation. Thank you so much, Tove, for this uh, interesting uh, presentation uh, about Tebe and how you work with uh, green space and uh, green infrastructure. I will start our presentation with summing up the main objectives of our Nord Green project. Next, please. We have one main research aim, and that is to investigate the association between access to green space and people's health and well being. We address this research aim with what we call epidemiological methods. To study associations between access to green space and health, we need relevant data to develop what we call indicators about both access to green space and health. An example of health indicator is stroke, and an example of green space indicator is distance to me to nearest green space. Emma and Helena will present indicators later in the presentation and how these can be applied to support planners in creating health promoting environments. Next, please. Epidemiology is an established research field and not only known from analysis of COVID-19 cases. Epidemiology is based on statistical methods. One example is how smoking is related to the development of heart disease. From a large set of individuals with information about smoking habits and knowledge about heart disease, we can understand the association been between smoking and disease and uh, uh, tell each other that uh, smoking, smoking is not good for our health. We do the same in our study. But instead of focusing on smoking and disease, we have investigated the association between access to green space and health. The purpose of this research is to produce knowledge that can support planners and contribute to creating health promoting environments across age, gender, education and immigration status. To study these associations, we need two types of data both health data and green access data. Next, please. Health data is available from two different sources, registries and surveys. Typical health registries are cancer registries and cardiovascular disease registries with information about relevant diagnosis. The second source is health surveys, where we ask people about their health and well-being. They were vary in size and complexity, but one survey relevant for us is Medborgarundersökningen in Sweden. This uh, survey is relevant because it focuses on inhabitants' satisfaction with their neighborhoods. There exists a lot of uh, map-based data that can be downloaded and used to perform green space analysis. National authorities, such as Landmeteri in Sweden and Geo Norge in Norway, as well as worldwide open source uh, sources, can provide data on green space. 
In the Nord Green project, we use national and local land cover and land use maps. One limitation with using green space data is that the categories are coarse. As planners, you may want to know more about details or qualities within green space types. And the last thing we do is to link green space and health data in the data files. And now uh, I give the word to Emma. Thank you, Guy, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I will now uh, continue to tell you a bit more about the health indicators. So uh, collection, analysis and usage of relevant health indicators are essential uh, for monitoring public health and to achieve public health goals. And as health comprises both physical, mental and social aspects, it is, uh, it is recommended uh, that we use multiple indicators in order to cover these different aspects of health. Health indicators, they can be uh, either objective or subjective. And the objective health indicators, they are always measured or determined independent of people's perceptions, such as, for example, uh, a clinical uh, diagnosis or specific blood parameters. Subjectives in, subjective indicators, uh, on the other hand, they are based on an individual's uh, perceptions about their own health. And the most common subjective indicator of health status used in national health surveys in the Nordic region is self-reported health, which is typically assessed by asking people to rate their overall health. Next, please. So this uh, table on this slide shows examples of both objective and subjective indicators uh, that has been obtained and used within the Nord Green project. The objective indicators listed are life expectancy in years, obesity, and incidence of heart attack and stroke, whereas the subjective indicator was perceived health. On your right hand side, you can see different spatial levels for which uh, the indicators can be obtained and analyzed. And commonly, many of the objective indicators are reported at municipal or district level, such as life expectancy within a municipality or incidence of heart attack within districts. Self-perceived health and obesity are measures that typically are collected from survey data, which are measured at the individual level. However, as described in the table, we can use these individual level data to compute mean values or proportion of obese inhabitants or proportion of inhabitants reporting that they perceive their health as good or very good within districts uh, or municipalities. It should be mentioned that this table just so shows some examples and does not provide a full account of existing indicators of health. But as you can see, there are a lot of indica indicators that can be used to monitor health in the population. And importantly, these indicators can be analyzed and visualized on maps. So next, please. As planners commonly use maps, communicating health indicators in such a way as depicted in these figures can be a powerful, powerful tool uh, for understanding and also visualizing how health status differs within a municipality, which is knowledge that can be applied for planning purposes. And the figure on the left hand side provides a visual presentation of the proportion of residents reporting high or very high well being in the 38 DSO areas or statistical areas in Tebe municipality. The darker color equals higher proportion of survey respondents reporting high or very high well being within the area. And from this, we see that many areas in Tebe have inhabitants with high well being. However, as also illustrated, there are a couple of areas with lighter color where less than 80% of the population report high well being. The figure on your right hand side is a visual presentation of the proportion of survey respondents reporting no health problems in uh, the same uh, statistical areas in Tebe. And as for the previous figure, darker colors equals higher proportion of inhabitants reporting no health problems. When comparing these two figures, we see that some areas have high uh, proportion of people reporting high well being, while at the same time, a lower proportion of inhabitants reporting no health problems. And the indicators that I've briefly presented today can be analyzed and visualized together with characteristics of the environment, such as green space, which Helena will tell us more about now. So I will now hand over to Helena. Thank you, Emma, and hi, everyone. I'm Helena, 
And I will now continue to green space indicators. And I think that's a field that uh, the planners are a bit more familiar with, maybe. So similar to health indicators, there are subjective and objective green space indicators. And examples of the objective indicators are, for example, the proportion of different green space types within the municipality, or the mean distance to green space from people's homes. And an example of a subjective green space indicator is survey data on uh, people's perceived access to green space. In Tebi, we used one subjective indicator and this was gathered from this Swedish survey Medborgerundersökningen, in which more than 1,000 inhabitants in Terby participated in the year 2019 and 2020. And one of many questions uh, the inhabitants in Terby answered in this survey was to rate how they perceived their health, uh, their access <laughs> to parks, green spaces and nature in Terby using a scale from one, which is poor access to green space, and 10, very good access. And we will now show results from the object objective indicators followed by the subjective indicator. So next, please. Overall, Tabby has 32% total green space, of which 30% are parks. And on average, residents live about 90 meters from nearest green space of any type. It can be forests, parks, and so on. And 230 meters from nearest park. And in comparison to the other municipalities in the North Green uh, project, Terby stands out positively with regards to access to parks. Parks are located near where people live, and there seem to be some kind of the park tradition, um, something I think also Tove mentioned in the in her presentation. In this figure, uh, next slide, please. In this figure, we show the results of two indicators, one subjective and one objective. The objective green space indicator is here the total proportion of land area devoted to parks, forests, and cemeteries within each this area. In the figure, darker colors indicate a high proportion of green space within the DESO area. And we also show one subjective green space indicator of access to um, green space presented as mean values on the map. You see the numbers on the map. And higher mean values shows that the respondents perceive access to green space within the DESO area as very good. So as you can see uh, on the mean values, residents in Terby were very satisfied with their access to green space. Almost 76% uh, of the respondents rated their perceived access to green space as high as eight or more on this 10, scale, 10 point scale, you know, minimum one, maximum 10. But interestingly, as depicted in the figure, the highest mean values do not always correlate with the darkest green colors. So next, for the um, as you see the yellow circle, people living in the center of Terby, they perceive their access to green space very high, it's in 9.13 here in the map. But the objective indicator shows that the access to green space is not the highest as compared with the other DESO areas, the dark, uh, the, the color and light green rather than dark green. And as you see in the orange circle, people living in very green surroundings do not necessarily perceive that they have good access to nature. So this suggests that people's perception of access to green space in Terby was not the same as their actual access. Next, please. So finally, what do we do with all these indicators? Well, um, planners are used to work in GIS with different layers, different sources, and they are used to add different kinds of green space data, but I think they are less familiar with the health data. And what you can see in this slide is an illustration of how the information from 
green space and health indicators can be compiled and analyzed jointly. And by making maps out of the health data, joint analysis of health and green space data can be used in the planning process. And when combined, the indicators can, for example, show inequalities and access to green spaces within the municipality. And the indicators can help planners identify areas that score low on sociodemographic or health statistics in these locations and in these locations focus on the environmental changes to develop health promoting neighborhoods and contribute to reduce health inequalities, for example. And if you're interested in more on sociodemographic differences in relation to access to green space, uh, you see a reference in this slide, uh, a reference, uh, an article that we published. So please have a look at that article if you're interested. And there are also more publications to come from the project. I think that's the last slide for me. And I hand back to Lisa and Annika. Thank you so much. Thanks to all four of you for these presentations and for giving us an overview, not over of Teabi and your work on green space, but all the findings that the No Green Project has had so far. And I thought I would start off the panel discussion by asking you, Gar, health has really been in focus the past few years. And what about the relationship between green space and health? Um, you've been researching this a lot. Uh, is it a new topic? No, it is not a new topic. And I think we can say that we have a lot of evidence that uh, access to green space is positive for our health. And that is uh, mental health. It is uh, um, the big disease groups like uh, cancer and also the life expectancy. I, I see a very interesting uh, question from uh, Richard Tuff, and that could be answered in the in, in the same uh, um, uh, uh, here as well. And um, uh, yes, when we have that knowledge, we we have uh, as good as possible uh, included knowledge about socio demographic or socio economic uh, conditions, because uh, uh, that is also important spot for health and. Uh, access to, to green space. So um, uh, that is one part of that uh, question. But uh, another question that uh, Richard uh, uh, addressed, that is uh, how um, uh, green space could potentially moderate the association between socio uh, demography and health, which is in fact not good. Uh, and could uh, <laughs> access to green space be a positive part? And uh, I think we have some few evidence that uh, that could be so, but uh, I think that is more in the research frontier. Great, Gary, thanks for that answer. And just to build off that a little bit more, I'm curious, since you've been looking into these sociodemographic characteristics and green space, um, what did you find in TABI? Um, how do these variables relate to green space access, particularly in TABI municipality? Uh, I think that we didn't find one answer of one finding in a way. But uh, we did find that uh, distance to forest and vegetation cover was associated with quite a lot of these socio-demographic, socio-economic uh, variables. And one finding that we, um, we uh, addressed and uh, included in our paper that was um, uh, distance to forest and uh, immigration status. So uh, it, was a, it was an association there. Great, and I'm going to turn to you, Emma. And um, in your presentation, you talked about how planners can measure health using perceived and objective indicators. What are the pros and cons of these um, <clears throat> different types of indicators? Well, that's an important question, Urais. Uh, as with research in general, there is both uh, strength and weaknesses, of course, with using different kinds of indicators or measures. What is important with both objective and subjective indicators is that they can be used to monitor changes in health uh, of a given population and inform discussions on priorities for planning. So considering the objective indicators, I would say that they are often less time consuming to obtain compared to subjective indicators when the indicators are openly available. 
However, these indicators are unfortunately not openly available for all municipalities, uh, as we have uh, noticed within the Nordic region uh, in this Nord Green project. If uh, we take the subjective indicators, they are feasible and they are also inclusive measures that can capture different aspects of health. Uh, however, it requires um, that the municipalities can collect information themselves often, uh, which requires both time and resources. And just to follow up on that then, do you think there are any health indicators that are most relevant to planners? Well, um, as mentioned in my presentation, health comprises of both physical, mental and social aspects and which indicators that are most relevant for planning depend on the goal that it's set to be achieved within specific context, I would say. Uh, if a municipality struggles with physical inactivity in the population and the aim of planning is to increase the proportion of inhabitants that are physically active on a daily basis, an indicator that captures physical activity levels would be essential. Um, but I will also emphasize that health indicators most relevant for planning purposes are those that uh, reflect significant national health topics uh, seen as having some social value and indicators that are underpinned by government health objectives and policies. Currently, I would say that subjective indicators of health and well-being are highly relevant within the Nordic region. Great. And on that, then I thought I'd turn to you, to Vessens. You mentioned that uh, Teavi does not use health indicators um, in relation to green space planning, at least now, not yet. So what are the some what are some of the challenges you see in using these health indicators in your planning? Um, I think, well, uh, I think we may use them, but not so much when it comes to the the, the planning uh, physical planning of, of the municipality. I, I think we still need more uh, guidance and help to, as I said before, uh, it's hard to, to, to judge relevance uh, of accessible data. And also it takes a lot of resources. I think if it should be, uh, if it could be to be included in, uh, in regular planning, in the municipality, it needs to be easy access, and I think we need to have uh, guidelines uh, how to use them uh, in an appropriate way. Uh, because as planners, we're trained to uh, to take care of physical environments and use with the, use these environmental indicators, but not so much the health indicators. So I think that's also a a, a problem of uh, maybe like education or how we put together our teams and so forth. Yeah, so you mentioned relevance, resources, easy access, guidelines. Are these any things that um, Tabby is developing to bring health and planning closer together? Do you have the resources? Do you have the time to develop guidelines? Um, it's it's difficult to say. I, I think that it's very interesting to look at what comes uh, out of this project and see if it's useful to us in any way. Um, and of course, areas that stood out to see are there any correlation uh, between uh, our indicators? Uh, is there any lack of green space in areas where people perceive lower health, state, health status? Um, but uh, for us, it's a bit difficult to, to fully understand the mechanisms and the causality behind uh, different um, health data to see like if is, is this connected to green space or not or, or other, other factors. So we need the uh, help from the scientific community or science uh, and maybe also from a government level, I would say. Great, thanks Tove. Uh, let's turn a little bit um, away from health indicators now and look at the access to green space. Um, Helena, you presented that there are both perceived and objective indicators as well when we're talking about access to green space. Um, so I wonder if they're also similar to Emma and what she spoke about. Are there pros and cons for using these access to green space indicators and what might they be? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Well, if we um... If we begin with the objective green space indicators, they give a kind of 
overview of available green space within the municipality. And um, they can easily be compared over time. And uh, so kind of showed you changes in the fiscal environment over time. But the limitation that is that the objective indicators only captures people's objective access to green space. We don't know if people use the spaces. We don't know if they are exposed to the, the greenness, so to say. So that's uh, definitely a limitation. And I think that's also response to one of the questions in, in the chat as well. Um, and pros and cons there's subjective indicators gives an understanding perceive their everyday environment but collecting perceived uh, indicators is time consuming and it's costly uh, because you have to involve the the inhabitants yeah Sure. Absolutely. And just a quick note to say that Heliana is having a, a few internet issues today. So if, if she lags slightly, uh, <laughs> that's the reason. But we're keeping an eye on it. And we'll let you know, Heliana, if we can't hear you or you're, you need you maybe to turn off your camera and just have the sound uh, to ensure that you still can participate. But we'll keep you updated. Yeah. Back to you, Lisa. Great. Um, and Helena, you showed a really excellent map where those perceived indicators and the objective indicators were a little bit uh, different. And we could see that even though there are some areas that have quite high objective um, access to green space, it's not always matched up with how people perceive those areas. Um, so I wonder, Helena, but also more specifically, Tuve, since you're familiar with Tabe municipality and you know the area, what would be some of the reasons why there is that discrepancy between the two? I, I think uh, uh, those two areas actually we we made a different analysis in the in the green plan when we looked at deficiency. Uh, so I think um, the area uh, the very green area where the uh, when the inhabitants uh, experienced lower uh, subjective uh, access to green space than objective access. It's, uh, it's the area where our uh, urban forest, our like central urban forest is located. Uh, the problem is that uh, we set this goal of, of 250 meters uh, to nearest green space via the uh, pedestrian network. And then we see um, a lot of people in this area have a longer distance. So even if it's there, maybe it's not available on a daily basis. Uh, because um, from other, so I think maybe it's a little too far to walk there. Or, uh, it may be an answer, mm -hmm. or there may be there are barriers uh, in some cases. The the railway, um, for example, that makes it difficult to cross. So that also makes distance a little bit longer. And um, the more central area where pe people experience very high access. We, uh, we actually have a, a central park that is one of our most like highest quality park and also like um, something we call the Hälsostråket. Uh, and it has a lot of, I think, qualities and uh, it's, uh, it's close to the, the houses. And I think that may be why people experience uh, that even if they don't have a lot of forests or they still have, uh, they still have a high perceived uh, access to green space. That may be some explanation. Well, very interesting to hear. Um, and I think you spoke about these railway barriers as maybe a potential reason why people don't perceive that they have the access that they do when the proximity shows it. Um, or on the reverse side, as you're saying, these high quality parks that maybe are designed in a way that uh, make people feel like they're closer than they actually are. So I wonder, um, based on some of these responses that you're giving to um, what are some other efforts that planners can make to provide access to green space while also accounting for some of the realities of the environment or infrastructure that already exist in the area? Yes, uh, I think in Tabi we're very fortunate and we were so happy to hear from your research that Tabi stands out positively and we know this and we want to really cherish that because it's a, a huge challenge for planners 
to correct uh, previous errors when it comes to access to green space because it's very difficult to 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 tear down buildings or to turn gray into green so um, the challenge is so we see that maybe it's not possible always to to create new parks in in every uh, where we see a lack of green space but rather working with the barriers maybe uh, creating new trying to see if we can create new trails if we have a little space or maybe work with the communication and lots of different things to uh, to um, make it more accessible uh, for inhabitants but it's it's a it's a challenge really to improve situations in existing uh, structures and I'm going to turn to you now, Emma, um, that uh, based on the presentation, uh, it sort of gave the idea that perceived and objective indicators are complementary, and so that it's important to have both to gain a holistic understanding. Can you um, describe a bit more how these different kinds of indicators can be used together, that is uh, health and green space, and how can planners use this data in their daily work? Yes, thank you. I can say a few more words. Uh, yeah, as shown during the presentation, of course, health indicators can be visualized uh, with maps to compare health across groups and within uh, context within municipalities. And this vi visualization can provide a picture of potential areas with need of an intervention, uh, which then can inform uh, discussions on priorities for planning. And then Second, uh, by linking health indicators with green space indicators, uh, it is possible to see if some areas uh, both, for instance, have poor environmental quality and also poor health status. Um, and this also can be used to inform planning and to further understand uh, what can be done with the, with the environmental quality. And lastly, also the subjective green space indicators provide an important supplement to the objective indicators because where there is strong discrepancy between the two uh, measures, they provide grounds for follow up by planners and other uh, municipal employees to really understand why inhabitants do not perceive their access to green space as good. Are there safety concerns, traffic or other physical barriers that must be considered? And I think this can help also with thinking not only about the green space when we plan, but thinking about how can we uh, contribute to create health promoting environments, uh, taking into account a lot of different uh, environmental aspects, uh, considering the built environment in general. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and in our previous Noor Green webinar, we actually discussed public participation and how the city of Espo engaged people to understand what spaces they use in the city and how. Um, so Helena, I thought I would ask you when it comes to perceived indicators, how do you collect this data and would it maybe be possible to use something like public participation GIS to collect it? Absolutely, uh, PPGIS, as, as we shortened it, is uh, absolutely one of the methods that you can use for collecting data about how people use and perceive their environments. And it's been a successful method applied in, in the ESPO case in the Nordgren project. So um, that, is, that is one way, and that's one way of collecting a lot of data uh, with a number of people, and in, in that's uh, in the ESPO survey study they used um, cooperated with schools so that's also one way of reaching out to the public because it's always a challenge to engage people to get people to respond to questions and participate in seminars and workshops and so on but um, yes there are several ways uh, seminars workshops uh, participatory GIS and many more it's very interesting to hear um we have some questions that are in the chat that I thought we might um, take on now. So I noticed one that's a little bit more of a technical question. Um, and uh, somebody's asked if you take ownership into account when measuring green areas in the city, or is this just looking at public green areas? Just do private areas, are they also part of the measures? We do not differ between uh, public and uh, private owned properties. Uh, we have discussed it in the in the project, in the Nord Green project, but uh, 
for us, it is a green space and access to green space independent of, uh, of ownership. Uh, concerning vegetation cover, it is uh, uh, satellite uh, images we, we use, so uh, there is no ownership or not possible to differ there. I'm going to jump in with a question that we had about, um, it says, would the initiative to develop these type of green plans come from the influence of international conventions or from a legal framework? Uh, and I, so I think that's specifically to you, Tabi, you uh, mentioned over that um, you could use more national guidance or guidelines. So I think maybe this relates to, to that issue that you pointed out. Uh, well, um, Boverket, uh, the, the Swedish, um, I don't know, planning uh, authority <laughs> has uh, guidelines for for green plans that are very helpful and uh, good, but not so much about linking health indicators to um, planning. Um, but uh, not, there is not a, there is no requirement for uh, no legal requirement for municipalities to have green plans. It's optional. Uh, the, the comprehensive plan has other uh, is more um, um, how do you um, mandatory maybe or mandatory or or more legally <laughs> um, it's more strict how it's uh, the the form and so forth. So green plans are a little more um, free. You can uh, use a green plan uh, a little freer uh, in the municipality. Um, yes, but, th but there are some, uh, uh, th there are guidelines and we use those a lot when we uh, develop the TABI green plan, but uh, they're not so much uh, concerning uh, linking, for example, epi epidemiological data and health data to, to green uh, space planning. Um, and it sounds like it's more national then, than maybe the international. You did a link to the SDGs and uh, Agenda 2030. You talked about that in your presentation. But, but in terms of concrete guidance that seems to be more on a national level that you use and seek. Well, the WHO has some uh, publications that links health and um, we use those. Uh, and we actually, we had, it was a collaboration with the SLU when we... <laughs> developed our green plan. So we had access to a lot of, because that's also a problem uh, as a municipality, you don't have access to scientific publications and maybe it's a bit difficult to interpret them and uh, to um, understand fully what they express and so forth. But we had this, uh, uh, this collaboration uh, with the university so we were lucky to have that and so we do we looked also at a lot of of the who uh what they recommended uh from but those were already uh kind of translated from an epidemiological uh, to uh green space indicator so for example they have uh we used uh, they say it's 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 bad to have over 300 meters to green space, that's bad for your health. So we, we say in Tabi, we should have 250 meters right. maximum to the nearest green space. So, so like that, we used it. And also when it comes to size and quality, we used both um, like um, best practice that we could find and looked at other municipalities and, and also, yeah. So in the, lots of different places. I'm here nodding my head when you say that uh, it's hard to sometimes interpret scientific articles and data, but uh, I think our <laughs> academics here can uh, provide some more details on some of these other questions. So Lisa, did you have one? Uh, you... Yeah, well, I was just looking at this question I find interesting about making sort of different calculations during wintertime um, versus the summertime. Of course, people use green space quite differently, especially mm. in the Nordics. Um, in the summer or spring versus in the winter when there are lots of snow and ski activities and things like this. Um, so I don't know if that's something that you guys have looked at or when some of these uh, survey uh, survey questions go out, if they account for these sorts of things for perceived, um, for perceived indicators for access. Well, I can maybe start and just feel free, Helena and Guy, to add. Uh, 
Well, um, in the, for instance, I, I've been part of this PPGIS survey that we also conducted in Stavanger, and there we actually asked uh, people to pinpoint which areas in the Stavanger they used and how often they visited these places during summer, spring, autumn, and winter time. And also in some, uh, at least in Norway, there are some uh, pu public health surveys that particularly ask about the use of green space during, during different uh, times of the year. So we are, of course, aware of, uh, of uh, that uh, people use, uh, I mean, use the neighborhood environment and green space uh, differently during summer and winter time, and that we actually have a climate that that also um, um, have some influence on how we use our environment. Mm -hmm. Jai or Helena, did you want to jump in on that one? I can maybe add <laughs> when it comes to Medbody on the Schöckningen, because we used we used the uh, perceived um, green space indicator from Medbody on the Schöckningen, and there was a question already in that survey uh, that we used, um, and that was not a question whether they used um, the green spaces um, they perceive their access to green spaces differences different in summer or in the in the winter uh, but the survey I think was sent out in um, September October sometimes so, and it, they had to reflect about their last four weeks of, of usage or so so I think um, of course it it's very much um, it's related to the summer season and how people perceive their access to green space during the summer season um, so the op optimal would be to be able to add questions to Medborg on the Undersökning because yeah. Medborg on the is, is run by the Statistics Sweden and if we would be able to add questions that would be fantastic but <laughs> uh, yeah so far we have to use what we have. Yeah, that makes sense. And I also feel like somebody has asked about um, COVID-19 and how that might also influence how people are responding or how they perceive their access to green spaces. People look to green spaces to, um, yeah, feel a little bit more, um, yeah, alive and uh, <laughs> a little bit more well. I think that's definitely been a big topic. So, um, yeah, having some of these questions in these surveys seems, yeah, quite, um, quite important. Um, I also see one more question in here that is about some of the economic impacts, and I know it's not something that you all have necessarily dug into in the current studies, but I'm just curious if you have any reflections. Um, somebody asks, um, have you done, in, done or planned to do any kind of economic calculations on values of green space, given that um, if green spaces are preventing health risks and health problems, then there might be some positive impacts on healthcare costs? Mm. Well, that was an extremely relevant uh, question, and uh, maybe that is a question politicians want to, to get a positive answer from. We haven't done it in our study, but uh, obviously there are some uh, things that needs to be evaluated. I think that uh, 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 researchers in Lynn have done some work on it, but uh, we, we have not included that in our analysis. And maybe I can add to a guide. I would also say, I mean, it's a really <laughs> important question. And I would also say, based on my uh, familiarity with the, with the literature out there, that's a kind of a topic of uh, research that really needs to be uh, more uh, more investigated thoroughly. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, lot of uh, research lacking on how to calculate and how can we actually assess the economical impact. Of uh, of having of access to green space and uh, how uh, um, how different interventions uh, can contribute to reduce the burden and how that uh, has an impact on the overall economic uh, situation, for instance, in different areas. Well, very interesting to hear, and hopefully we can look forward to some of those mm -hmm. studies in the future, as it is, as you say, very um, very important. Um, uh, I think I'm maybe... sorry. Uh, I, can I just add there are. There are some publications uh, really interesting about trees recently uh, and the tree economics and things uh, and publications from different um, uh, international municipalities and even from I think the World Economic Forum. So when it comes it, when it comes to the value of trees, there have been some uh, publications I know, but um, I think it's not always easy to interpret to a local um, context. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I think the first step here that you guys have done of putting together access to green space and health is a great sort of step in that direction of then figuring out down the road what the economic um, impacts are. Yeah, broadening broadening sort of the value of green space and how we can sort the indicators. Then the next mm -hmm. step maybe can be the economic. Um, I think we're running out of time here, and so we may not have gotten to all questions, and if that's the case, we can try to follow up afterwards. Um, I think there are some to the individual panelists, so we'll, we'll try to get them to them. And um, I'd like to first of all thank all four of you for joining the panel and joining us today, and of course all of you in the audience. As I mentioned earlier, we will share the presentation and the recording in the coming days. And I also want to remind you that we will have a third webinar in this series, and that will be in September. And then we'll learn about how you can, uh, how green space can improve health with a special focus on our partner Stavanger, which uh, Emma also mentioned earlier, and they've been exploring some new design methods. So stay tuned for that. Yes, and if you would like to stay up to date with the Nord Green Project, you can sign up to our newsletter. Um, our colleague has posted it in the chat. Um, you can go there and sign up and you'll get notifications about our future webinar as well. Um, so thank you all again so much for joining. Um, if there are any final words, I suppose, from our panelists, if there are any final messages you'd like to share before we um, wrap up, we have just a minute or two. I would just say thank you all for participating. And uh, thank you also to Nordregio and Lisa and Annika who has coordinated this webinar. Thank you, Emma. Our pleasure. Good. Well, then we will see you all next time in September. Thanks for joining. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you so much.